Hi and welcome. Hi, Mike. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Guys, it's so great to have you live with us. If you're joining us on Facebook, let us know who you are and where you're from. We're really excited to be chatting today with Mike Farrell about Labrella. Labrella's made some really interesting waves in the community. Um, I know Vetri Habers around the world have been talking about it and asking questions about it. So we're really happy to have Mike here with us today to chat about this and to share his knowledge and to share his information. Um, I see that there are a few people joining us in the back end of the studio. Um, I think you shared the wrong, wrong link somewhere on Facebook. Please join us directly on Facebook through the Online Pet Health Facebook page. Uh, I see you guys streaming in live, so welcome. It's so great to have you. As we get started, I just want to let you know that um, because this is a little bit of a um, it is a little bit of a topic that a lot of people have questions about. What we're going to do is Mike and I are going to chat through the most common questions and concerns so that we all have a similar baseline of what Librella is, how it's being used, um, and where we should and shouldn't be, be using it. And when we come to the end of the interview, we'll open things up for questions. So this is a little bit different from how we usually do it, where I generally invite you guys to ask questions from the beginning. I think let's get the foundation set and then open for questions at the end. All right, so Mike, can you please introduce yourself and let us know what your interest is in Labrella? Right, yes. So I'm Mike. I uh, I go by Mike rather than <coughs> Dr. Farrell. And, um, and I'm a board-certified specialist in small animal surgery. I started my career in veterinary anesthesia. Um, so I also have a certificate in veterinary anesthesia and a special interest in pain management, in particular, chronic pain management. Um, every talk about, <coughs> about a painkiller has to start with a disclosure um, of conflicts of interest. And my disclosure is that I have no financial conflicts of interest. Um, I, I'm not linked to any drug companies, supplement companies, um, or, or nutrition companies. Um, so, yes, my interest in Librella is sparked by the fact that I'm interested in, in companion animal pain. Awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. So let's let's talk about what Librella is. Uh, there are, I'm sure I'm not the only one who doesn't have any exposure to this drug yet and um, doesn't know why it's being used or prescribed or why it's making such big waves. So what is Librella and how is it being used? Uh, well, I, I like to I like to explain things using analogies, um, and and the analogy that I will give today um, it's it's a new one for you. I gave uh, another one last week. Awesome. Is um, is about um, pain, which is a noxious stimulus, um, being like an unpleasant sound. <clears throat> so we start with this. We've got this noxious stimulus with unpleasant sound. Now acute pain. That's like somebody scraping their fingers down a blackboard. <clears throat> and you know that when they get to the bo bottom of the blackboard, the pain will go away. The noise is going to disappear. There's an end point to it. So your job, while this noxious stimulus is there, is to either um, turn down the volume on the pain, um, mm -hmm. stop, stop the pain entirely, um, <clears throat> which, is, which is possible with some kinds of painkillers, or to ignore it, ignore the noise. Um, but what you do know with acute pain is it's going to go away. You've just got to mm -hmm. sit it out somehow. And chronic pain um, is like a, a, an unpleasant song which is playing on loop over and over again. There's no off switch. You can't turn it off. Mm -hmm. So your options in managing chronic pain are to pretend it's like acute pain and try and turn down the volume and hope it's going to finish but it never will. Or you try and get rid of the music at the, at the very beginning. So you try and get rid of the actual music or you put earplugs on, <clears throat> something to drown out the noise. So the traditional painkillers that we give, um, things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, opioids, etc., they turn down the volume on pain and nerve growth factor acts like uh, earplugs. It's something to muffle out the noise, right? <clears throat> so, so that's 
that's the mechanism that we're talking about. How it actually works is that it's a drug which um, mops up a chemical called nerve growth factor. Mm -hmm. So nerve growth factor acts all over the body. It acts um, specifically in some certain types of nerve cells which are responsible for sensation, but it also acts in all other cells all around the body. So not just nerve cells, but in cells in bone, in cartilage, in skin, um, in white blood cells. Mm -hmm. So it's all over the place. And, and, and Librella's job is to mop up this nerve growth factor so that it doesn't cause problems within the, within the body, um, which are related to too much nerve growth factor causing pain. Uh, can you describe the role of nerve, nerve growth factor in the body a little bit more deeply? What is its job and why is it there? Um, so it, it has, um, it's called pleiotrophic, which means it's it's got um, multiple jobs, um, not, not just one. So when you're growing, um, it has a job to, um, to tell the nerve cells to develop. So it's, it's absolutely key in developing of nerves. And then once you, once you reach adulthood, its job changes to protecting those nerves. Um, so it, it develops a maintenance function. So it protect, protects them, it encourages nerve growth, and if a nerve is injured, it, it helps that nerve recover from the injury. Um, mm -hmm. So the, its, main jo its main jobs are related to nerve function, but it has all sorts of other different functions as well. For example, functions in bone turnover, functions in cartilage turnover, functions in immune in, in immune function. So lots of different jobs um, within the body, and those jobs carry on throughout life. Okay. So what happens if we block the nerve growth factor and does Librella block it completely or does it just reduce its amount um what is Librella doing to the nerve growth factor in our bodies or patients bodies yeah um so the nerve growth factor acts on a, a couple of receptors one of them is called a high affinity of a receptor um which is called a tyrosine kinase receptor it binds onto that receptor and then it tells the nerve cell to, to do a job or any cell to do a job. Um, so when we give uh, an antibody to that, what we're trying to do is, is mop, mop up the excess. We're, we're trying to allow enough for it to do its essential job, but, mm -hmm. but not, not too much. <clears throat> uh, the parallel that I give for that is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, we've got an essential process, which is inflammation. If we don't have inflammation, we would die. Um, but too much inflammation causes a problem. So what they do is that they suppress a uh, type of cytokine called cyclooxygenase, just suppress that cyclooxygenase just enough so that we don't have too much inflammation, but we've got enough to survive. And that's what, that's what Librella does. It suppresses the growth factor, nerve growth factor, just enough, ideally, so that we don't have side effects, but we do have effects. Now, if you completely knock it out in an adult, which is what was done originally in the early studies in rats, to completely knock out nerve growth factor, it will, it will make those, those animals ill. Um, so in rats, what they were seeing when they completely knocked it out um, was that they saw um, problems related to learning, um, they saw problems related to um, nerves, that is that the nerves got smaller and lower in number, some of the important sensory nerves, um, and there were immune problems in, in those rodents. So we want to suppress it, but not completely knock it out. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, all right, so to everyone who's joined us live, it is so great to have you. Welcome. Um, we're going to hold off on most of your questions until towards the end um, so that Dr. Mike and I can just establish a little bit of a foundation of knowledge. Um, and then what we're going to do when we do take those questions is um, we're not going to talk about specific patients and we're going to try and keep them specific to to Librella and to what we've chatted about today. So thank you guys for joining us. It's so great to have you. Um, all right, let's see. What You spoke about the early studies of Librella now. How long has it actually been around and what is its evidence basis at the moment? Yeah, so uh, 
a longer time than people think. Um, so um, the, the initial application for an experimental drug license is 20 years old. That's 2004 um, when, when Pfizer applied for a license for a human version of the drug called tenezumab. Um, then um, cl clinical trials are done initially on experimental animals. So it starts with rodents um, and then moved on to humans. In people, the first clinical trial, so randomized control trial, was done in, it was published in 2010, and that was for osteoarthritis. 2011 um, was the first study to treat lower back pain. Um, and then there was a hold on clinical studies, which lasted five years long between 2010 and 2015. No one was allowed to do clinical studies during that time because of uh, concern about side effects. Then the studies restarted um, in 2015, um, and then the veterinary products um, had um, some more studies done on them um, in actual clinical patients. And those studies were published within the last uh, three or four years, five years. Um, so, so, so yeah, that we got an evolution of studies starting with experimental animals, then humans, and then um, clinical trials in dogs for Librella or Baranza in in Australasia, and then in cats for a similar drug called Silenzia. Okay, so what are some of those side effects that showed themselves and stopped the clinical trials? Okay, um, so the side effects that stopped the clinical trials in people were. Um, two types of side effects. So the first hold was put on for a problem called rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. And the second hold was put on for um, uh, autonomic nervous system problems. So, so sympathetic nervous system problems. <clears throat> so rapidly progressive osteoarthritis um, was happening depending on the trial in anywhere from less than 1% of people um, to in some trials, over 6% of people were developing this problem called rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. Um, they saw a significant increase in people needing joint replacements um, that were having these drugs. And we're talking about a lot of people in these trials. There's over 10,000 people that have been involved in these trials, much, much bigger trials than in, in veterinary medicine. Um, so um, the that was the first one, rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. And then the second one was auto autonomic nervous system problems, um, which is the part of your nervous system that is controlling your everyday functions. You know, it's critical functions like your heart rate and rhythm and your breathing and your digestion and your um, urination. They're, they're all controlled by the autonomic nervous system. So that hold lasted three years. It was put on... Um, initially because of con concerns in rodent models. Uh, as I mentioned to you before, these rodents were um, developing problems related to their nerves, smaller nerves, fewer nerves, and learning problems. Mm -hmm. Then they repeated the studies, but they did them in monkeys. Uh, and then they said, actually, this is not a problem. And the FDA and European Medicines uh, Association is accepted that they would restart, but there was a caveat put on that um, everyone who had any suspicion of a sympathetic nervous system problem was, was excluded. You're not allowed to go into a trial. Okay, so is there a connection between a pre-existing nervous system problem and yeah. then developing side effects with, with Librella? And has yeah. that been in the next series of trials, would those effects eliminated by removing that group of patients from the trials? Uh, that's an extremely good question. Um, so um, what they did in people, um, which was starting in 2015, was that they have um, very strict guidelines as to how to pre-screen people for any kind of sympathetic nerve problem. So if you've got a heart rhythm problem, for example, you are not getting on, on the drug trial. Um, um, if you've got a problem which um, seems like it, it would be minor, minor to us, like a bladder problem, if you've got urinary incontinence, you're not going on that trial. Um, okay. Then there's a, there's a system um, where you can, you can do a survey. Anyone can do one of these surveys and you can look them up. It's, I write the name down. It's called the Survey of Autonomic Symptoms. It's got 12 questions on it 
a survey of autonomic systems, you run through those questions and the maximum score, which is the worst possible score, is 60 for a man. Um, it's lower for a woman um, because in men it in includes can you get an erection. Um, and then if you, if you get higher than 7 out of 60, you're not getting the drug. Yeah. Um, th th there is no veterinary equivalent um, because in, in the veterinary trials, which were very much smaller, the veterinary trials, um, although there were some kind of um, uh, problems related to nerves, they happened infrequently and they seemed to be milder and they weren't considered um, something that warranted um, those special precautions. Nevertheless, um, taking precautions is a good idea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in, in animals, we don't have that same screening process, but the side effects that we see are also not as severe. Is that right? Uh, another very good question. Um, so the two, the two big ones that cause problems in people, what we're talking about, the first one, rapidly progressive osteoarthritis, that's the reason that it didn't get a product license. So that, that was outright rejected in 2021. Okay. And then the drug the drug's basically been dropped. There's no new cl registered clinical trial. So that's rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. Now, um, in order to know if somebody's going to have rapidly progressive osteoarthritis, you have to take multiple x-rays, x-rays mm -hmm. in series. So that was part of the testing take an x-ray at the beginning, keep taking x-rays over and over again and see, see if you get a problem. Mm. That wasn't done in dogs. Um, so in dogs, one of the trials, um, which are out of three that were used to get a license, used experimental beagles, took some x-rays at the beginning, took some x-rays six months later. The, the results of the trial published last year said, we didn't identify rapidly progressive osteoarthritis Therefore, dogs don't get rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. Um, but the analogy that I gave is it's a little bit like trying to predict the end of uh, the score at the end of a game of football, rugby, American football, having watched the first five minutes of the game wearing mm -hmm. shades. They didn't look very hard for this problem, mm -hmm. so they can't say it doesn't exist. Mm. So do you think that the evidence that we have that supports its use for dogs is it sufficient? Well, it's not. Um, <laughs> you keep asking me questions. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, can now, we rely on that evidence? Or essentially, should we say, hey, we need better evidence here. This isn't good enough. Can we well, ask yeah. better questions? So it's uh, so an excellent question, right? Um, so it's the same organizations that, that make the decisions. It's the FDA and the mm -hmm. EMA that make the decisions for people and the decisions for animals. Mm -hmm. They looked at higher quality evidence for, for licensing in people than they did in dogs. There were far more people. Uh, they looked harder for conditions. It was a much stricter process. Yeah. And they said no. But, but when, they, when they went through less strict process for animals, they said yes. Now, how you look at that depends on your perspective. Now, from my mm -hmm. perspective, um, I look at it as being a benefit to us because we have a drug um, that is a very, very good drug, a very powerful painkiller. Mm -hmm. If you use it in the right circumstance, it can be life changing. And I, I would rather have it than not have it. But having it on the shelf and saying this is a drug which is completely free of side effects, I don't think is a fair thing for us to do. I, I think we have to say we've got a really good uh, painkiller. Just like all really good painkillers, it has side effects. There's things we don't know about it at the moment, and there's things that we have to keep looking for. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a long answer, but that's my answer. No, I, I mean, I, I, I do love that because at the, as a veterinary physio, you know, we love to say we are using evidence-based practices and techniques and the truth is that not all of them truly are because the evidence that we have have small sample sizes. Um, they didn't necessarily look at all the different variables. However, it's very different when we're looking at a drug versus a technique 
that we're using and then reevaluating as we go and where the side effects are not necessarily serious. We might have a little bit of an increase in pain or we might not achieve our goals, right, of strengthening or pain control from a physio perspective. So it, it, it is quite different if we're looking at a drug. But I always like to question, you know, if we're relying on the evidence, are we actually relying on good evidence or are we just saying it because it's nice? <laughs> There's been clinical trials and they were good and the results were positive, so we're using this. Um, so, okay, no, I think that's a really good answer. And, and you've highlighted that this is a tool that can be incredibly valuable. So can you go a little bit more into that? I, it, as I understand, Liberella is primarily being used to treat arthritis. When is it used for arthritis? Which are the patients that it should be used for? Talk a little bit more about what its clinical, um, when is it, when is it, when do we want to use it? Yeah, okay. Um, so I guess we, we have to sort of set our base rate. That is the problem that we're treating. And the problem we're, that we're treating is specifically osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. We can move on to off-label use if, if, if you want to. But if we talk about specifically osteoarthritis, our base rate is that about, we think about a quarter of the dogs, companion dogs in the world have clinically important osteoarthritis. So as an example, let's just look, because it's convenient, at USA alone, the numbers in the USA. So about 100 million dogs in the USA. Quarter of them have clinically important osteoarthritis pain. 25 million dogs have osteoarthritis pain. Of those 25 million dogs, half of them are untreated. They don't have any treatment at all. So we've got, in the USA alone, 13 million dogs with clinically important osteoarthritis pain. Why are so many dogs untreated? Um, well, there are lots of different reasons, um, but one of the reasons could be that people are intimidated by painkillers. Um, mm -hmm. They, you know, they they don't they don't want to give a painkiller for fear that the side effect of the painkiller is going to be more important than the effect of the painkiller. Yeah. Um, but we have to see what it's doing to the dogs. And if you look at it purely in mor mortality. About one in 10 dogs in a British survey ultimately lose their lives because of osteoarthritis pain. Um, that's just osteoarthritis. We've got other types of pain too. So the, our base rate is a serious, serious problem. And we have a lot of dogs that cannot tolerate non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We've also got problems with compliance of giving those drugs. You know, you have to give, remember to give a drug once or twice a day. Um, so Librella as an alternative um, is, has some appeals to it. Um, it's relatively cost effective. Um, it's a powerful painkiller. Uh, we can go into how powerful in a moment. Um, it's quite convenient. And for many dogs, it appears to be very, very safe. Um, the side effects that we're talking about seem to happen relatively rarely. We've got to remember in, in Europe alone, in the first two years, about four and a half million doses uh, have been <laughs> have been shipped of this drug. So, you know, this is a drug which is which is very popular. It's being used a lot. So we have to put things into context. Now, how powerful a painkiller is it? Well, in, in people, it's a it's about like for like with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They're about equivalent to one another. What tends to happen is that. Um, the nerve growth factor antibodies get off to a faster start. So when you give it after a month, you get a more profound initial effect. By four months, it's way ahead um, oh, compared wow. to a non-steroidal. And after that, they kind of join up. And in mm -hmm. the long term, they're similar. So the first type of animal that it's, it's good for is one where you can't use a non-steroidal. Yeah. And then the second one that it's good for is an animal that's you're using a non-steroidal, it's not giving enough pain control and you need to add something else on top, which is another conversation. Um, but we have to be a bit careful about using it as a blanket painkiller for all animals. Um, and we have to look out for the animals where maybe it's contraindicated. 
Okay. So I just want to say another welcome to everyone that's joined us live. It is so good to have you all with us. Uh, what Mike and I are doing is we're just kind of discussing the foundational questions around around Labrella, and then we'll open up to questions from the audience towards the end. Um, okay, so that's so primarily we're using it for osteoarthritis, and we're using it when uh, non-steroidals are not an option, or when we need an additional on top of the non-steroidals. Um, so. <clears throat> Uh, okay, let me just do this because otherwise I can't concentrate. So, <laughs> hi, <Hello. laughs> so happy Valentine's Day, everyone. Happy Valentine's. <laughs> okay, sorry. One second, guys. One <laughs> Priceless. <laughs> <laughs> These are the benefits of working from home. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay, fantastic. Um, so those are the indications. What are the contraindications? We're screening our patients. When do we not want to use Librella? Okay, well, it, according to the data sheet, um, don't use it in animals who are one under one. Um, it's only licensed for osteoarthritis pain. Um, so... Um, it's not indicated to use for other types of pain, but we can still have a discussion about that um, because it often is. Okay. And um, so those are the those are the official contraindications. We've got young animals, uh, shouldn't use it for pregnant animals. That's always one of the contraindications, just about every drug. And, um, and we, sh we shouldn't use it off license. Okay, so off-label use. Do you want to touch on that? Because you've you've mentioned that there are more spaces where we might want to use it. So what would those be? Yeah, this is where it, it becomes quite difficult um, talking about off-label use. In, in, in lots of different ways, it becomes difficult. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you've got this idea that pain is pain. Um, uh, or, you know, all pain is, is, is important. Um, and if you've got a painkiller that's capable of treating any type of pain, you know, why not use it for any type of pain? And it has been successfully used to treat low back pain in people. Um, it didn't get a license for that either. And it seemed to perform worse in people to treat low back pain in part because in a person, osteoarthritis pain, and um, we've got mainly two types that were treated, knee osteoarthritis and hip osteoarthritis. Mm -hmm. They are they are homogenous conditions. They're quite predictable. One arthritic knee is a bit like the next arthritic knee. One arthritic hip is a bit like the next. So you kind of knew what you were getting. But with, as you know, as being a physio, mm -hmm. low back pain has got uh, many different aspects to it. Yeah, you've got discogenic pain. You've got muscle pain. You've got articular facet pain. And then you've got all these other things that go in that area, which contribute mm -hmm. to the pain. Mm -hmm. And it seems that all of these different types of pain responded differently to drugs in the class of Librella. So the responses seem to be unpredictable. But what they concluded um, it was that the side effect profile of it didn't justify the benefit. That was that the side effects were much the same, whether you had low back pain or osteoarthritis mm -hmm. pain. But the benefit of it was relatively smaller for low back pain. The challenge that we have with animals is that um, it is, is if you've got an animal who's got pre-existing problems of nerves mm -hmm. and you give this drug, could it worsen the problems of their nerves? Mm -hmm. Take, for example, a dog who's got degenerative myelopathy. You know, the beginnings of a German Shepherd dog with degenerative myelopathy. That dog is going to need all its nerve growth factor because the nerve growth factor's job is to safeguard what they've got left mm -hmm. of the nerves that are working in their back. So the, in principle, if you give something which suppresses those nerves that are trying their best to hold everything together, then you could make their neuropathy worse. Mm -hmm. And now this is something that's not been, this is a theoretical thing, it's not been proven, but at the moment, you know, we're collecting data. This is called phase four clinical trials to see 
do, are these things happening out there when we've got bigger numbers of animals that are being treated? So I encourage people um, who are seeing a dog, whether you're a pet owner or a physio or a veterinary surgeon, if you have a dog who seems to be getting worse with spinal problems that they're on Librella, you have to ask, could the Librella be contributing to that problem? And it's in the same way as if you had a dog that was on non-steroidals and they started being sick or having diarrhea, you would stop the medication first, regardless of whether it was the cause, mm-hmm. and and then make a decision about what to do next. It, it should really be the same with Librella. If you've got a side effect that might be related to the drug, you should ask, is it? And if it yeah. might be, proceed with caution. Okay. Okay. No, I, that makes sense. You, you You stop what you're doing evaluate what could be the cause and then reintroduce pain management from there once the once the once the symptoms or side effects that you're concerned about are are under control and dealt with right um so you mentioned them uh insights and labrella being used together is there do we have studies and you you describe that kind of um rapid improvement on the labrella with a slower improvement on insides and that comparison, do we have direct data that compared the use of NSAIDs with the use of Librella in an OA model? Do we have that? Um, yes and no. Uh, <clears throat> so in in the studies that were done in people, which is the bigger scale studies, um, one of the big concerns with rapidly progressive osteoarthritis is that it was, it was significantly more likely if you took a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug at the same oh. time. Okay. Um, so, so there are different hypotheses for why rapidly progressive osteoarthritis happens. So the one that everyone should be able to understand is um, if you lose uh, the ability to sense where a joint is in space, if that joint seems to be uh, relatively numb, then you load it differently, right? In the same mm-hmm. way that if you couldn't feel pain in your hand, and you touch something hot, you wouldn't know you touch something hot and you'll damage your hand. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons why they think that rapidly progressive osteoarthritis might happen, because it works so well that it means that you can't sense where your joint is in space and you load it abnormally. Um, But the second um, reason is that it actually changes something physically within the joint. Um, And so one of the things that nerve growth factor is involved with is bone turnover. Mm -hmm. So it's got an important role in, in, in telling bone to, to keep turning over, repair yourself, repair yourself. And so do non-steroidals. They're involved in that process as well. So the second hypothesis is that if you give the two together and it interrupts bone, bone turnover, you're actually incapable of healing little tiny microfractures within your joint and then the joint starts to collapse. So so when the when the two were given together, um, a much higher chance of seeing um, uh, this rapidly progressive osteoarthritis. Now the problem in animals um, was that in the in the trials where they gave non-steroidals um, in in those healthy beagles, they only gave the non-steroidals for two weeks. Oh. Okay, so yeah. it's not not really long enough to, to to that's not a fair test, right? When you only mm-hmm. give them for two weeks, mm-hmm. some of the dogs in the field trials were given non-steroidals as well, but they didn't look for rapidly progressive osteoarthritis in those animals. And then one of the papers that I um, summarized on the Facebook page, Vet Lessons on Librella page, um, that I just put out a few days ago, was about studying rabbits. And in the study in rabbits, they, they, they created an unstable knee joint. They sectioned their meniscus, so they've got an unstable knee. Then half of the rabbits get uh, equivalent of labrella and half of them don't. Um, and then they looked at what happened to their knees. And, and in the rabbits that had uh, the labrella equivalent and the unstable knee, they had very rapid progression of osteoarthritis compared to the other ones. So if you've got an unstable joint or you're giving a non-steroidal at the same time, then potentially there's an increased risk of progressing the osteoarthritis you pay the price for your better pain control by more accelerated arthritis. But 
this is this is a a discussion which isn't based on the field trials um, that were published to get a license in animals. Mm, okay. Yeah, that's that's definitely something to think about. Um, way up, way up the scales a little bit. Mm, okay. So right now, it's being used in dogs. Lots and lots of it is being used and prescribed. Um, you mentioned that it's convenient from an owner's perspective. How is it administered? Um, so it's given as a subcutaneous injection. Um, it has been mm -hmm. given initially as an intravenous injection. Then when they changed it to subcutaneous injection, they found that it was it had similar effects. Um, okay. So that made it more convenient to use. Um, initially in people, it was given every two months. And in people, it's every two months. And in animals, it's given every month. Okay. Interestingly, um, there's a quite a big dose range. Um, so 0.5 to 1 meg per kg. Um, now, there's, there's plenty of evidence out there that the side effects are related to dose. Mm -hmm. So the lower dose seems to have lower side, side effects than the higher dose. Now... The way that it is dosed, and this is kind of a, a practically very important thing, is not that scientific in that you you take a vial, there's a there's a chart that you look at and you say, well, this dog needs this many vials, and there's a big range. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a 30 kilo dog, you're going to give a 15 milligram vial, that's half a mig per kick. If you've got a 30.1 30, 30 kilo dog, you're going to give a 20 milligram vial, your dose has jumped right up because you're in the next category. So one of the things that I would encourage people to do um, is actually give the calculated dose, 0.5 meg per kick. Um, you can increase the dose later, but if it were me and my dog, I wouldn't do it according to a chart. I would give them the measured dose at 0.5 meg per kick. Okay, and that's that's a subcutaneous injection once, once, a, month. A, once a month. I mean, yeah, that's pretty convenient um, from an owner's perspective. It's not a daily thing, but it is a monthly thing that has to be added into their schedule where they need to go in and see their vet, which yeah. could be very good because it gives that opportunity to monitor the progression of OA on a monthly basis. Um, so with these, these patients that are right now receiving Librelan on it, how are their responses to treatment being monitored? How are side effects being monitored? Are they being are they being monitored, reported, um, taken back to Zoetis, who's created the drug? Is there a process going with that? Yes, um, there is. Um, there's a reporting process. So um, uh, the first question is, how do we know how well it works? Um, you can either kind of do what everyone does, which is to say, I just, my dog seems to be better. <laughs> they, they seem to have better exercise tolerance. It's, it, it's not very scientific. And now uh, something interesting happened in the two field trials um, when they did this. Um, uh, so in, in the field trials, they were almost exactly the same design. One of them was done in Europe and one of them was done in the USA. And interestingly, um, the results uh, were actually quite different because the people giving placebo in Europe were about half as likely to see a benefit from the placebo than the people giving a placebo in the United States. Okay. And the, the moral of the story there is that when you really want your animal to be less painful, yeah. whatever you give, you're going to look for the good in it. Um, <laughs> Now, Librella is a, is a powerful painkiller. It's proven a powerful painkiller. We've got to watch out um, for people uh, thinking that things that aren't powerful painkillers are. So a placebo, a saline injection was seen in the US studies, 37% at one point said, my dog's much better uh, mm -hmm. after receiving a placebo. So I would say try and be as scientific as you possibly can there are questionnaires out there that you can fill in, not necessarily CBPI. The, the most practical ones are load. And the one that I use a lot, um, which is 
I don't think used enough um, is the Helsinki Chronic Pain Index has a, a, a catchy named um, Porsima um, app. Um, and Porsima is, is really good. It's a little subscription fee, but it's super worth it. And if, if you're a vet, a physio, a pet owner, I would encourage you, I'll give you these graphs. You can chart mm -hmm. the progress using Porsima. And that would be a, quite an objective way of monitoring progress. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're seeing side effects, how you report those depends on where you live. Different, okay. different countries have different processes, but you should report it. And my experience is that re the reporting process is very straightforward. The drug company is very open um, and, and very helpful. People have got to remember uh, the, the drug company, actually, they made all of their studies open access. Everyone can read their studies. So they're trying to be transparent, um, which is hats off to them for doing so. Okay. So that's fantastic. I was thinking about the canine metrology instruments as well. It would be really simple to say every month you come in for your injection, you fill out the questionnaire, we, we keep track of what's happening. And um, yeah, that doesn't take any extra time really from the veterinary practice. You just give the owner a questionnaire. I didn't know there was an app or yeah, that's amazing from, yeah. from the Helsinki pain index. They're, they're all validated. Um, yeah. there, there's a lot of work done on them. The similarities between them. Um, but I, I like the Porsum, Porsum one enough that I, pay a bit of money to subscribe mm -hmm. to it. It's, it's not very, very much money, um, but it's, it's really practical. The challenge that we have with these metrology instruments is that they've been around for a long enough time. They're simple enough to use, but they're underused. Yeah. It, really, we should all be using them all the time. Yeah, um, I agree. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I think even for us as physios, I think it should be a part of our regular reevaluations. If you're, you know, reevaluating a dog every six to eight, six to ten treatments, they should be filling out. A, the owner should be filling out a canine metrology instrument. Um, yes. Whichever one works for you, whichever one works for you and your practice, because there are a few to choose one to choose from. Cody is another one which is very simple. Um, I don't think it's as complete, but it gives you the, you know, the necessary information for, for the owner yeah. and for the dog. Um, I think it's important as well when we're communicating with vets, when we're building those relationships. Here, I can show you some data plotted on a chart. <laughs> I love it. And of course, um, uh, the, the other thing is accelerometers. Um, yeah. And, and if, I, if I had a physio practice, you know, I, I would be absolutely every, I would want every animal with an accelerometer. You know, I, there are disadvantages to the quantified dog and the quantified cat. Um, but I think the advantages for a painful animal of using an accelerometer uh, uh, outweigh any disadvantages. And it's the same, you, you know, you've got an app and you can see the numbers. It's useful information. Yeah. It's very useful information. Um, all right. I think another question that I have about Labrilla is, um, is there, so you have spoken about a bit of a loading period where you're getting an increased response. Is there a tapering or a plateau that happens um, or a habituation that happens to the drug where it becomes less effective? Do we see that at all with Liberella? Yeah, it's a very, very good question. So that the, the trials that were done to get the license with gave three doses. And what they were seeing was an improvement um, across those three doses. So, the, so the, it says it in the data sheet, if you don't see an improvement after one month, be patient because you might see an improvement after the second injection. But if you don't see an improvement after the second injection, you, you probably won't see an improvement. And then um, you kind of have to then ask, why am I not seeing an improvement? And that means going back to your physical exam is the most useful thing. It might be that the animal's got uh, this uh, a dog's got cruciate disease you know and if you if you see an animal with cruciate disease and it's subtle and you haven't picked it up at the beginning and you give librella what would you expect to happen well if they've got subtle cruciate disease without much instability you would expect their pain to improve mm -hmm. but their instability to get worse right because you, you've done nothing to treat that and as yeah. time goes by you'd expect them to get worse same with the dog with maybe very lax hips your, their pain will improve but the laxity won't 
you'll expect them to get worse over time. So there should be a little alarm bell that rings to say, well, why is this not working as it should? Mm -hmm. Because osteoarthritis in, in dogs always has an underlying cause. You should go back to saying, what's that underlying cause? And, and is there another way of treating it? Mm -hmm. um, then, of course, there's a long-term uh, issue. So the long-term issue was that only, what, 63 dogs completed a nine-month study. Um, we didn't have a positive control group for those dogs. Um, they, they were compared to, 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 to nothing um, because it wouldn't be fair to, to have, uh, well, they didn't think it would be fair to have a negative control group and they didn't have a positive control group. So very small numbers um, had long-term um, use, and that was only nine months. Now, the longest study in humans um, is a year and a half, and what they mm -hmm. saw was um, ta tapering so that once you got to four months, that was your best effect, and then it, it tended to, to get gradually worse o over time. Okay. And in the human trials, about half of the people actually dropped out because it wasn't working well enough before a year had passed. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. So you're going to get to a point where it will probably taper. And then there's going to be the feeling of, well, we need to add something else, right? An additional drug to keep the, the pain under control, or increase the dosage, right? Mm. So I guess what you, you know, sort of have to think of the, you imagine your, your hands can't feel any pain um, mm. and you, you can't afford to touch those hot surfaces that rule still applies all the time. You have mm -hmm. to look at all those other things um, mm -hmm. at the same time. It, it would be easy just to give this very powerful painkiller and then to say, well, great, that's doing all the job I need it to do. But you need to prioritize all those other things. And that means keeping your pet as lean as they possibly can be, regular checks with a physio. Um, so physical therapy, super important. Um, and then not just physical therapy in a clinic, but, but physical therapy at home. Um, so all of those things remain critical the whole time. Um, we, we don't just give a drug and forget about them. That's not what, what, what the treatment is about. Interestingly, by the way, I forgot to say before, in the, in the surveys that were done of vets, um, it ended up being one of the advantages ended up being that they used it as monotherapy almost always. And um, so either it was so good as a drug um, that mm -hmm. they said, well, we don't need any other drugs. You can give intermittently some non-steroidals and that's enough. So that is mm -hmm. a good selling point, but that's just the drugs. The lifestyle things are, remain super important. I love that you brought that up because we like to forget that our pain management pyramid is built on a foundation <laughs> of lifestyle changes, um, physiotherapy, education. Yeah, we forget that part. <laughs> yes, but you know what? This is this is the crux of it. You've got lots of different ways to treat pain, and um, if you're given an array of different choices of how you're going to treat pain. You can pick the ones that you think are easiest or nicest or less expensive, and you can talk yourself into those things being very effective. The challenge that we have is that the things that work best aren't the easiest path. No. So, you know, going to a physio week after week, you know, ideally maybe twice a week, that's great. You should do it. But there's a cost entail, there's inconvenience entail. So people think, well, why would I do that when I can just give a supplement? <laughs> Maybe that'll have the same effect. It won't. Or my dog needs to lose weight, um, but that means I have to give them less food. They love food. Why would I do that? You know, or, why do you do the things that are difficult when everyone's having you believe that the things that are easy are going to have an equally good effect? At the end of the day, the things that have the best effect are hard. You know, yeah. lifestyle management's hard. Weight loss is, is hard. Um, surgery is difficult. Um, yeah. and, and a drug like Labrella, perfect example. It's a, it's a good drug, but it's got negatives as well as positives. There's no free lunch. Mm -hmm. I, I really love, I really love what you're saying because I think, you know, we can sometimes feel frustrated when we have patients not referred to us because they've just been put on x y or z or 
you know, the vets recommended that course of action. But it, the reality is that it's what's easiest for the owner. And whether that is the vet's perception of the situation or the owner's perception of the situation, there is that shared idea that this is the easy path. And that's really powerful. That's really powerful for us when we don't have a lot of time, when we want to have good relationships with our clients, when we want to tell them what they want to hear. It's nice to tell them what's easy. It's really hard to tell them, hey, your floors are slippery. You need to make adjustments here. Your dog cannot jump in and out of the car. That stuff sucks. It really does. <laughs> it's not yes. fun. So yes. I think that's really important. Um, another thing that you mentioned with the um, with the anti nerve growth factor is proprioception and the change there. And I think this is something really important for us to understand because if we have an altered proprioception as a result of a drug that our patients are on, how does that impact us? Ninety five percent of the, the time, one of our goals is to improve the proprioception of a specific area of, or of the whole body, because the moment there's pain, we have a change and altered proprioception and we need to restore that. So what is the impact of having these patients on Labrella? How, how do we work around that in terms of proprioception? Because the, the benefit of any pain management, any pain control is that we break that pain cycle. Us as physios get in there, we improve their strength, their proprioception, their ability to, to functionally work with the condition that they have and then we have an improved outcome that's no longer reliant on the drug because we have taken some of the cause of the problem and reduced its impact. So can we still achieve that when Librella is blocking proprioceptive feedback or are we fighting a losing battle then? How do we adjust our approach? Nobody knows. <laughs> Okay. I feel so bad because it's such a good question that you worded so well. And then, <laughs> but, but, but nobody no, knows. I think, that, I, know. I think even if we just think about it, we need to evaluate our patients and have that in our mind. If we don't have the answer, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, well, uh, uh, there's another guide that I put uh, on um, on the Facebook page and it talks about, um, neuropathies and at the end of the day in a perfect world if a pet has a neuropathy you would get a diagnosis first right you want to know what that neuropathy is because there's lots of different types and mm. um, you can't always do that because the tests to, to find out what type of neuropathy it, it is they're expensive often you know, mri scans etc they're expensive tests so what you end up doing is treating symptomatically. And if I, if you're treating a patient with a neuropathy symptomatically and you're giving nerve growth factor uh, antibody at the same time, you, you are at cross purposes in principle. Mm. Um, so if there's a known neuropathy, I think there should be an awareness to say, well, you might be treating a dog with osteoarthritis they've got two problems at the same time but you've got to consider that that you might be making one problem worse in order to make the other problem better and as physios i think it's a matter of having the awareness that this is a potential problem um, and feeding back uh, to saying uh, if this is a problem that's getting worse can we try is there a way we can try without the drug now if, if you've got a dog that's life is much much better on the drug well, sometimes you have to tolerate the side effect. Yeah. 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 That's we we make that decision or help our owners figure out that middle ground all the time. Sometimes we have to live with the consequences, but we have an improvement in some other area. So, no, that makes very good sense. Um, and I, I I need to wrap us up now because we're getting to an hour, which is far too long. Um, and I love that in this interview. I got to ask all my own questions instead of everyone else's questions. I feel very special. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I know I always prioritize your questions, but I thought that for this topic, we would be able to do it better justice um, by not taking that normal pathway. Um, 
So I think where I'd like to end off is um, obviously as, as vet rehabbers, we're not the ones prescribing Librella. We're the ones that are treating the patients who might or might not be on it. Um, and generally we have patients that, or clients that will come to us with questions because they're not sure, um, or they have been advised to follow one course of action versus another, and they're not sure. Um, and that's why it's so important for us to know because, um, because we're so often just that space of comfort and education and an ear to listen and to understand for our clients which is one of my favorite things about our, our role. Um, so as a kind of final question, how would, you, how would you recommend we discuss this issue with clients um, if, we, if their patient has something and there are alarm bells going off for us, um, there's some you know, underlying neurological symptoms um, and the vets recommended they go onto Labrella how do we have that discussion with our clients and walk them through it um, and be that place of comfort for them as well as of education? Where would you kind of describe our role in education for our clients? It's not easy, is it? Uh, because <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> Welcome to our lives. <laughs> There's all these sets of toes there and you don't want to tread on yes. any. Um, so when I, when I started... Um, the Facebook uh, uh, group, Bet Lessons on Librella group. Uh, uh, this this was kind of the scenario that I had in mind. I wanted to have a place where I could send my own clients and say, "Well, ah. this this there's a library here of this information. Um, go and have a look at it. It's it's mm -hmm. there." Um, I designed the guides so that they are presented in as plain English as that, 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 that's possible. Um, so I use readability software uh, in order to make sure that they can be understood by lay people. And I send my own clients there. I say, well, <laughs> you can trust me. And I actually backed myself at the beginning by, um, I contacted a hundred of my veterinary colleagues and said, can you join this group, please? Um, so there were all walks of life um, within the veterinary industry that mm. joined up at the, at the beginning, and they keep me honest, right? Uh, they, I can't go on there and make stuff up, or uh, why mm. would I? But if I, even if I wanted to, I can't, because I've got, I've got people watching me who mm. are making sure that I say the right thing. So uh, you don't have to have the conversation if you don't want to. You could look at the resources that I've put on there. And if you think, yes, uh, these are suitable, then you can share them with your clients. Mm. Um, the, otherwise, I'm not sure. that People will go online and get information mm. online. Mm. Um, and some of it will be very good and, and, and some of it not so good. Okay, so your group, Vet Lessons on Librella, um, you have a Facebook group and a YouTube channel, is that right? Yes, uh, so I, I started uh, with a YouTube channel and I've got a website um, which is just called Vet Lessons. And then um, I started the Vet Lessons on Librella uh, in August last year. And it's taken far too much of my time, far too much work. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I'm familiar with that situation. Okay, yes. so do you discuss what kind of things do you discuss in that group? So, if someone wanted to learn more about the evidence or the you know the published research in this area, do mm. they go to your group? Um, yeah, is it all there? Um, so there's a there's a file section, and in the file section, I um, take the published research and I translate it because it's devilishly difficult to make sense of the published research. These papers are horrible to read, even for me. And so I'm, I'm trained, you know, my residency program, they teach you to, to interpret this stuff. And I find the research very, very difficult to understand. So I spend um, a day or so for each of those summary documents, translating them into normal English. Mm -hmm. And there'll be links and cross references. So in the file section, you'll get that. And then there are videos. And in the videos, I will tackle a subject 
and um, usually talk for a few minutes on a particular subject. And they're aimed at everyone. You know, they're targeted so that a pet owner can understand them just as much as a specialist in, in surgery can understand them. Um, so that's what you'll find. That's what we find there. But what you won't find is discussion. Um, it, is a, it is a no discussion forum because I need to remain sane. And if, if there's discussion, it's unsustainable for me. I'll shut the group. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. I agree with you. And I think that's completely fine. Um, can anyone join your group? Yes. So I I wanted everything to be free access. Um, mm -hmm. So so it is. Anyone can join. But there are a couple of rules uh, there, which are very simple rules. Um, uh, one is that there's no co there's no comments. I, I, I don't there are no comments on any of the, the guides. You, if you can share them and comment away. And the second one is that you can't make your own posts on there. And it's strict. If someone posts on that page, uh, uh, there's no questions asked. They just get blocked. Sorry. Um, that's, uh, I, I, I learned the hard way that that was the, the, the only approach which works. Okay. No, I think that is fair. As you say, running a group is actually a lot of work. Putting out the information is a lot of work. So that's, yeah, that's fair. Um, all right, guys, I am going to wrap us up. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined us live. Mike, thank you for your time today. It's been really great having you. Um, you guys are going to head over to Vet Lessons on Labrilla on Facebook if you want to learn more, if you want to dive into the research. It's a fantastic resource. Um, okay, guys, have a wonderful Valentine's Day. <laughs> Mike?